and uh, let me uh, introduce today's speaker, Jamie. Uh, Jamie Fernandez Fisak is an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at Princeton University, where he directs the SAFE Robotics Laboratory. His research combines control theory with machine learning and artificial intelligence to enable robots to operate safely in the physical world and the human space. Prior to joining the Princeton faculty, he was a research scientist at Waymo, formerly Google's self-driving car project from 2019 to 2020, working on autonomous vehicle safety and interaction. Jamie received his engineering diploma from the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, Spain in 2012, his master's in aeronautics from Cranfield University UK in 2013, and his PhD in electrical engineering and computer sciences from the University of California, Berkeley in 2019. He's a recipient of the Lake Aisha Foundation Fellowship, the Leon Ocho Award, and the Google Research Scholar Award. So, Jamie, please start. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex, for the introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to come and give a talk. I'm very excited to, uh, to have a few minutes to share some of our uh, recent research ideas and uh, efforts with you. And uh, hopefully, uh, towards the end, we can have a discussion um, about uh, what, are, what are challenges that remain ahead and what are um, exciting opportunities. So here we go. All right, so uh, as you may have seen uh, from uh, the uh, description of the talk, I'm going to be uh, in particular talking about uh, a problem that we think is uh, quite fundamental and really one of the main um, open challenges in autonomous driving, and that is handling occlusions in a way that is uh, safe in a in a in a strict way, while at the same time um, not um, impractically conservative. Uh, so this is you know the, the little cartoon that we often use, um, where we've got our uh, ego vehicle here in orange um, behind a truck. It's trying to decide whether or not it's safe to initiate an overtaking maneuver, um, but given its currently limited field of view it cannot be sure um, whether um, there's somebody coming. If it's an oncoming vehicle and it just goes and executes the maneuver, it might find itself in a position where by the time it's detected the, uh, the oncoming vehicle, uh, there's no longer an available safety uh, maneuver. And so uh, we call this class of problems occlusion games. And um, uh, in particular, what we, what we try to do to approach the situation is look at it from a uh, strategic perspective and uh, introducing tools from dynamic game theory to reason about the ways in which the ego vehicle, but also other vehicles in the environment can gather and uh, adapt to information over time as the um, interaction unfolds. Um, and so uh, in particular, we're interested in multi-agent environments. We'll talk about uh, what some of the limitations are in the current guarantees that we're able to provide. Um, but we are actually quite excited with some of our recent results because they, um, we think that they open up a new way of thinking about these problems that uh, would uh, significantly reduce the conservativeness of decision making uh, for our uh, vehicles and in general for our robotic systems when they have uh, limited sensing capabilities. Um, um, and uh, you know it, it, it does as well, uh, ensuring that we actually maintain safety in a in a rigorous way. Um, okay, so oops, sorry, that's uh, um, that was my uh, internal outline slide. So uh, uh, a little bit about me, uh, complementing what uh, Alex just said, just to give you some context. Uh, so I am an assistant professor at Princeton, where. I teach and I uh, do research in the field of robotics. There's a little picture of the uh, new undergraduate robotics course that we put together. We built a uh, sort of mini city environment and we have these uh, miniature 1 16th scale autonomous trucks and uh, students had to program them to do a number of um, 
fairly complex tasks, including uh, interacting with multiple vehicles, reasoning about um, intersections when they didn't have full visibility, and so on. Um, so I, uh, as uh, Alex mentioned, I went to college in Spain. This is um, a picture of me uh, misbehaving in the front halls of uh, in the main hall of our university in Madrid. And um, along the way, I got interested in robot safety, uh, especially uh, during the year after my undergraduate degree when I was working with drones. And here you see me uh, trying to maintain um, a very rudimentary safety framework for our drone, which was holding onto a rope to make sure it didn't fly into the neighbor's backyard. Um, then I got my uh, PhD at Berkeley in the same lab as uh, Vicence. Um, and so uh, a lot of a lot of the ways in which I think about safety and autonomous systems are um, very much connected to the discussions that the two of us had during uh, our PhD as we were trying to get our um, our uh, drones and our uh, robots to not crash into each other or into people. Um, and then uh, the year after my PhD, I spent uh, some time at Waymo as a research scientist working primarily at the intersection of interaction and safety. And, um, uh, you know, as, uh, as a result of all of this, I've been, um, I've been uh, developing a certain perspective and certainly some uh, strong opinions about how we should go uh, about uh, guaranteeing safety for these autonomous systems. And um, I'm going to try to share some of uh, some of these ideas with you. And of course, uh, you may um, you may uh, disagree with some or all of them as you see fit. But hopefully, I'll be able to at least change your mind about um, about one or two ideas. Um, okay. So very quickly, this is our lab. It's the Safe Robotics Lab. We started in uh, the depths of the pandemic in summer of 2020. And uh, our general goal in the lab is to pave the way towards robots that can operate safely around people. Um, and this means working on uh, both theoretical insights and algorithmic tools for robots uh, and for autonomous systems to actively ensure safety as they navigate uncertain environments, uh, and in particular environments that are dynamic, they change over time, and uh, include other agents that are then going to interact with our autonomous system so that ultimately safety is not entirely up to our robot but is actually a function of uh, others behaviors and uh, to the extent that our robot is able to influence those behaviors it should have a good um, model of um, how it is able to do that and to what extent it's able to do that so to, to do this, we ultimately bring together a number of different tools from control theory, artificial intelligence, game theory, and um, uh, in many cases, cognitive science when we want to, especially when we want to quantify our uncertainty about the behavior of other vehicles. Although I'm not going to talk as much about that um, today. But you know, we could uh, meander into that during the discussion. All right, great. Um, so. Um, very quickly, and I'm sure that a lot of you working at Neuro are uh, more than familiar with this idea. This we we are facing an interesting time in robotics, and that on the one hand, really exciting changes are happening, and then the the potential for impact is certainly growing with uh, many new applications. Uh, but historically, many of the analytical tools that we've uh, that we've been building through the years in the field of robotics. Uh, were really built for this classical uh, robotic setting uh, with repetitive tasks. They could be complex, but they would be repetitive and well understood in structured environments uh, with well understood dynamics of the uh, you know the motion of the robot itself, and uh, certainly always isolated from humans, um, precisely for safety considerations. So usually, all of these industrial cages where the robots would operate would have some kind of sensorized access, so that if a human uh, ever got into the space without um, without permission, the system would immediately shut down um, and uh, it would not resume operation until uh, the human had left the space and the, the system was um, was cleared for um, um, 
for resumption of the operation. Um, even with that, accidents have happened uh, over the years in, in factories involving uh, robots. Often when the human gets into the cage or forgets to leave the cage and turns on the robotic system and somehow this fail-safe method fails. Um, but they've been quite limited. Now, what is exciting, but at the same time extremely challenging, is that the new setting where we envision our uh, many of our robotic systems operating looks much more like this than like a factory floor. And this, this means that tasks are no longer repetitive. Um, there's uh, going to be permanent changes in the environment. Even if we're doing the same route, it's going to be completely different, uh, you know, Monday morning and uh, Saturday night. and um, the degree to which the environments are structured is much less uh, so, especially because now we have uh, many other agents invading the space and uh, their behavior is, uh, in many cases, not perfectly understood. So uncertainty certainly plays a massive, massive role, um, as does interaction. And um, the dynamics are, in some cases, not perfectly well understood because, you know, the uh, the the friction on the road uh, can change. There might be potholes. These can change over time. Or if you're flying a drone, uh, you cannot control or perfectly predict the, the speed of the wind. And there might be gusts and turbulence and so on. Um, and um, most importantly, we just cannot separate uh, the notion of uh, safety or even of uh, successful task completion for our robots from interaction. Um, because these uh, these systems are just going to be uh, fundamentally needing to um, to navigate these multi-agent environments. All right. So what I'm going to do is very uh, quickly uh, talk about how we how we think of, of building from the traditional tools and the traditional formulations in robotics towards this uh, more general setting where we can. Um, where we can actually start to account for other agents and for and for some of these uh, interactions and um, uh, the the limited perception, which, by the way, I should have uh, I should have mentioned in the in the previous slide. One of the things that we um, used to have uh, the luxury of in industrial settings is we would censorize the environment as needed. So anytime uh, we felt we didn't have all of the necessary information for the robot to complete the task, we could just add sensors to the robot or to the environment. Um, and you know that that would uh, immediately uh, take care of the sensing issue. Um, but this is not a thing that we can do in in very large open environments, like, uh, for example, in the case of autonomous uh, driving. Now we might be able to introduce some infrastructure sensing to mitigate um, some of the difficulties, but it's it's hard to imagine that uh, we're going to take care of all of the sensing limitations by doing that. Um, so anyway. Let me um, let me sort of uh, paint this little picture where we've got a um, uh, robotic system, uh, you know, with with a, a traditional good old fashioned planning problem. So often, what we want to do is, given a certain uh, model of the robot's dynamics, which could be given to us in continuous time or in discrete time, and assuming that the robot has either a good estimate of the state space or some um, uh, sorry of, of the current state or some uh, way to uh, sense it. Uh, sufficiently accurately, the robot's uh, job is to now figure out what actions to take over time in a way that maximizes some particular uh, reward or or minimizes uh, some particular cost um, uh, related to the tax that it's trying to accomplish. And uh, often, what we're trying to do, in addition to, for example, minimizing the uh, the energy expenditure um, uh, to complete the task, is we'll want to satisfy a couple of important um, conditions. And one will be that we want to make sure we avoid obstacles or any sort of unwanted conditions uh, that the robot could find itself in. And uh, this is what we usually call the safety requirement. Um, and then we want to make sure that eventually, at some future time, we, we reach a state where the task has been uh, successfully completed. And this is what we often refer to as liveness. And um, uh, notice that the main difference between these two uh, requirements is the second one is about some future time, whereas the first one is about all future times, right? And so safety is really about a condition that we need to make sure is uh, upheld at all times. Um, 
and uh, this is a good part of why it is a challenging problem, especially in the face of uncertainty, and especially when we're dealing with fairly long time horizons, which I'll uh, I'll get into uh, in in more detail in a moment when we talk about multi-agent systems. Okay, so things get a little bit trickier when we introduce other agents into the environment. Um, and essentially, in order to still be able to uh, plan uh, using the tools that we were thinking about um, a moment ago, we're going to need to have a predictive model of the human's behavior, because without that, we simply cannot um, we simply cannot plan because we don't know what is going to happen. And planning is, you know, is uh, the business of thinking about the future and making decisions that affect it in a way that we can predict. Okay, so uh, let's start by assuming that the robot has some way to uh, measure the current state of other agents. Typically, these other agents are going to be humans. Um, and uh, let's say that it has some computational model that allows us to make uh, a prediction about how the human is going to behave over time. Well, if this is the case, then the robot can uh, very well uh, plan around the human as a moving part of the environment, a moving object, which is something that we have the mathematical tools to do. So here's a little example. Our human, uh, say, uh, is known to uh, want to reach this tile that we've uh, highlighted. And so we predict that they're going to move straight towards it at a certain speed. And so here's a little drone uh, figuring out how to navigate around the human. So nothing particularly fancy. And you know, if, if things were always like this, we would be able to extend our um, old robotic tools uh, fairly easily to work in the context of other agents. Unfortunately, this is not always the case here. A little illustration is somebody spilled some fake coffee um, in our lab. And now what's going to happen is our human is still being predicted to move in a straight line towards the goal. But it turns out that uh, she's going to decide not to follow our model. How dare she? And now the robot uh, miscalculates, gets into a state from which it's no longer uh, able to avoid a collision. And you can see how upset the human is uh, after this uh, failed interaction with the robot. OK, so give me a second to uh, mute my notifications. OK, so what? Uh, What's going on here? Of course, we forgot to account for uncertainty in our predictions. And so we're going to be talking about uh, uncertainty uh, quite centrally here, because the way that we think about safety is very much connected to the way in which we think about uncertainty. There's uh, there's a couple of different ways in which you can go about uncertainty. But ultimately, this uh, in the, for the purpose of uh, having other agents, this just means that the robot needs to account for the possibility that um, the human might act in more than one way. So in worst case uncertainty or robust uncertainty or non-deterministic uncertainty, what we do is we just say, well, the human's action is just going to belong to some set of possible human actions. Usually what we're going to do is bound the speed at which they can walk or the acceleration with which they can uh, jerk around. Um, and by doing that, uh, we can compute what's called a forward reachable set. Uh, at any future time, which is the set of all states that, according to the dynamics and for any possible action or sequence of actions that the human might take over time, um, um, th these are states in which the human might end up at the time of interest. And we can uh, compute this at uh, any uh, particular time. Now, the the very serious limitation here is that the longer our time horizon, the more actions a human could conceivably take. And if we're assuming that they could do genuinely any sequence of things uh, over time, then for a sufficiently long time horizon, we're just going to conclude that the forward reachable set is immense. A human could be anywhere, right? So it's one thing to say, where are you going to be in the next second? Uh, but if you have a human in a room and you ask, where are you going to be in the next 10 seconds? Um, unless it's a very big room, the answer is, well, probably anywhere in the room. Um, and so the way in which we try to uh, enforce safety is uh, going to be, in the case of using forward reachable sets, to say, well, the robot must have a plan such that its uh, future state at any time tau will not be inside of the forward reachable set of the human. Or if we want to be a little bit more rigorous, we should reason with a footprint of uh, the robot and the human in sort of the, the, the shared space, with, which in this case would be uh, 3D Euclidean space. And so we say that the footprint of the robot should not overlap 
with the footprint of the human. Now, the problem with this is, uh, of course, that the robot might conclude that this is impossible uh, for anything other than a very short time scale. And we'll look at a couple of examples where this actually has been you know, proposed and attempted in autonomous driving, but it ends up just leading to very conservative behavior. In some cases, the vehicle simply concludes that there's nothing that it could do to maintain safety. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, commonly used uh, model of uncertainty when modeling multi-agent systems um, is based on probabilistic representations of what the human is likely or unlikely to do. And here, uh, cognitive science um, comes in our aid and uh, provides us with a family of models that usually tend to work fairly well, statistically speaking, where we just assume that the human, if, if we're able to estimate or learn with uh, data over time, a utility model for the human that tells us how much um, uh, the human prefers certain types of actions, uh, actions to others, perhaps related to what goal they're trying to pursue, um, then the probability that they will take a certain action grows exponentially in comparison to the others, the more advantageous that action is for the particular goal that they're trying to take. And so this is expressed with this little uh, Boltzmann type exponential distribution. Um, where Q here is the action, the state action value function of the human for taking a certain action, control action U from state X. So an example of this is if the goal, which we're parameterizing here with theta, is for the human to leave the room, then the uh, probability distribution of human uh, trajectories might look something like this in a sort of cartoonish way high probability for motions that go straight to the door, lower probability for motions that are slightly inefficient and indirectly go to the door, and then very, very low probability for uh, actions that take the human uh, away from the door, for example. And so there, what we would do is to say, well, okay, let's make sure that we keep the probability of crashing into the human below a certain threshold um, for every future time. Now, the problem with this kind of model is that it sounds really reasonable in um, in principle, and it actually works well in practice in many cases, but it, it has a fundamental limitation, which is that it is blindsided completely by low probability situations. Um, and so, you know, the robot might um, successfully navigate around the human for quite a while while the human is moving around. Um, and then at some point, the human is trying to leave the room, and then a bee flies into the room, the human starts running away, and suddenly crashes into the robot. And what happens here is that this is something that our model hasn't been able to capture because we haven't really seen that many humans running away from bees or doing some kind of uh, unusual behavior um, that uh, that might still happen. And the the, the problem is that when, when you're dealing, uh, as you all are, with a large scale uh, deployment problem, the situations that are very sparsely represented in your data set or perhaps not even represented at all in your data set until now might indeed be the most safety critical ones. And so saying that your uh, autonomous system is safe uh, and you know avoids uh, collisions with people 99.999% of the time is actually not as great as it might sound uh, at a at first pass because it could be leaving out a lot of really important situations that are actually very low probability because um, as, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, if you've been looking at the, the driving logs uh, from your systems, a lot of the driving, probably more than 99.9% .9 of the driving is extremely boring. There's nothing special going on. And sure, your system is going to be safe during all those uh, times and in all of those situations, but that doesn't necessarily capture safety in, in the way that we would like or in a way that is as meaningful um, as we would want it to be. So, you know, at the end of the day, because these unlikely events are unavoidable uh, in real world environments, and if you've got a large scale deployment, uh, then unlikely events will certainly happen eventually and probably a couple times a week at least, um, we really need to have a formulation for safety that accounts for these uh, unlikely possibilities. And of course, you probably see where we're going with this, because when you're dealing with navigating around occlusions, 
probably 99.99% of the time, nothing's going to come out of the occlusion. But sometimes there might be something that comes out of the occlusion, and you don't want to be uh, entirely blindsided by it. Um, so you know, in terms of uh, human behavior, um, while we don't want to assume the humans will always be reckless, the fact is that sometimes they can be. So here we have a pedestrian suddenly running across the road uh, in an unexpected way. Here we have two pedestrians that uh, suddenly decide to get in a fight. And one pushes the other. And of course, uh, when this kind of situation happens, we need our autonomous system to be able to handle it. OK, so um, another issue is that human behavior uh, and uh, the uh, autonomous system's behavior are actually coupled with each other. right? So we need to be able, as we were saying, to account for uh, what that interaction could look like, which is kind of the first, um, first motivation for bringing in um, game theoretic tools and machinery to reason about uh, these problems. Now, in terms of how this challenges our framework, the main challenge is that when uh, we assumed that we knew what everybody else was going to do or we knew how the world was going to behave, it was easy to define optimality given all of that. But when uh, there are multiple agents with possibly different criteria trying to decide what is optimal or what is an appropriate thing to do, and suddenly everything is cobbled into a joint system with you know, a single state X with many different uh, inputs uh, from each of the agents. Um, and as we said, these agents might disagree on what, the, uh, what, what better means, then how do we define optimality anymore? And of course, this is not, a, you know, this is not only specific to, to robotics. It's generally true for multi-agent decision making. And so we have to replace the uh, sort of nice and clean definition of optimality uh, through extended versions of that that work for multi-agent systems. So we might have a notion of an equilibrium, which is a set of strategies such that no agent, if we arrive at that set of strategy, then no agent will have an incentive to deviate from that. If it's an actual equilibrium, no agent can, uh, no agent will want to deviate unilaterally, assuming that everybody continues to do the same thing they were doing. If it's a leader follower or Stackelberg equilibrium, then no agent will want to deviate accounting for how their deviation might affect the deviation of others in response. But in any case, it's, it's a notion of if we get to a certain agreement, uh, whether implicit or explicit, about what strategy to follow, then this is a stable agreement and we'll, and we'll uh, stay there. There are other uh, definitions that uh, require, in some cases, cooperation or coordination, such as a social optimum, where we just decide to aggregate all of our, all of our objectives into a social cost function and then try to optimize for that as a team. And then some sort of compromise-based versions like uh, Pareto optimality. At the end of the day, the, the particular solution that we choose will only be valuable to the extent that it actually captures something about the behavior that other people are going to follow. So uncertainty is still going to be uh, extremely central here. But it turns out that these uh, different game theoretic uh, solutions often do allow us to describe and predict the behavior of others with less uh, error than we would have if we were just pretending that they're moving obstacles or that they're just optimizing their trajectory, assuming that they already know exactly what we're going to do and assuming that they cannot affect us, which has been shown, unfortunately, to fail quite miserably in, the, in certain situations. Um, OK, and finally, most importantly for what we're going to uh, be thinking about today, the um, predictions that uh, that we need to make of humans uh, are harder to make when we can't even see the humans right now. If we don't know where they are now or what they are doing right now, it's it's harder for us to uh, figure out where they will be in the future and what they're going to do. But it turns out that it's not impossible, and that's um, um, it's it's a trickier but uh, but uh, still very interesting problem. OK, so the long tail here when we talk about occlusions is that, well, we want to, we don't want to always be assuming that we're going to be blindsided by objects. We also don't want to assume that we won't and then in practice find ourselves blindsided by these objects or agents as they appear. So again, we have the example of somebody suddenly jumping out of, from behind some uh, hedge. Um, and this is an interesting uh, example uh, that uh, one of my PhD students found of a Tesla autopilot approaching um, uh, a bunch of uh, traffic stopping the highway and not detecting them until it's pretty much on top of them. 
Um, and you know the reason uh, the reason for this is that the the uh, the if you go to the sorry I'm not sure why the I had a little error but for some reason it's not showing up. If you go to the beginning of the video, uh, the traffic is uh, is stopped behind the curb, um, and there's sort of a, a race barrier that prevents it from uh, detecting them at first. Even though you know a human driver who was paying attention probably would be able to uh, infer that there's actually uh, traffic down ahead. So you know how do we how do we uh, deal with these uh, uncertain um, objects that might exist uh, just beyond our field of view? Um, so the way that we like to think about these uh, these safety guarantees in our lab is not through uh, probabilities that might accidentally leave out something important, but through sort of the clear defined, uh, well defined and clear cut uh, if then style safety guarantees, and by that. Uh, what we mean is uh, reliable and uh, what we normally call hard guarantees on under which conditions the system can fail and under which conditions the system cannot fail. So you know, if this set of assumptions hold, then our system will not have a failure of a certain kind. We won't have a uh, front collision or we won't drive off the road or we won't get uh, too close to a certain agent. Um, and this, we think, is really important to generate trust in, uh, in, in these systems coming from uh, the public and coming from um, the, the engineers who are building it and the, and the, and the uh, human users who are, who are interacting with the system. Um, so these guarantees have to be transparent and, uh, and sort of uh, understandable both to engineers and to the general public, um, ultimately making it so that we can not fix them uh, by ourselves as technologists, but actually engage in a certain kind of social contract type discussion about you know, what are reasonable assumptions that we can make. And uh, this is something that we do with many um, uh, types of engineering systems. Um, to some extent, every time we get on an airplane, we are we are accepting a social contract by which if both of the pilots or however many pilots we have on board become incapacitated, uh, at the same time, during the duration of the fly, well, we might not be able uh, to uh, make it home safely. Um, on the other hand, we we accept that those are conditions such that if something like that happens, it's not it's not because the plane wasn't well designed, and it's not because someone lied to us about how reliable these systems were. And that's something that is more um, again usually generates more trust than just giving up. Uh, uh, single number, 99.99999%. Um, it's not that those numbers aren't useful, but but they're not very transparent. They're quite opaque. And so the idea um, with these uh, types of safety guarantees is we want to have something that is uh, understandable and that can be part of a discussion with society about whether these guarantees are strong enough for uh, us to deploy a system. We also want the guarantees to be checkable and enforceable at runtime by the autonomy stack. In other words, the robot should be able to reason in terms of the, these guarantees, and it should be actively making sure that uh, these guarantees are not being violated. And uh, related to this, it should also be able to maintain a log uh, such that if uh, there's a failure or a near miss, we can look at those logs and sort of trace back the log to whatever went wrong. Did the environment violate one of our assumptions, in which case, Maybe we need to revise the assumption, or maybe we need to accept that this is one of the cases in which you know that the meteorite hit our car, and that's just not part of uh, the the specification that our car is supposed to be able to handle, um, or whether there's something that went wrong in the way that we designed the system. And so this allows for accountability and uh, sort of a remediation of uh, any sort of failures. All right, so we think of the operational design domain as being really central to the way in which we can quantify these guarantees. And uh, I know that uh, at Neuro Operational, the operational design domain is very much part of how you think about um, defining uh, the boundaries of operation of your system and, and, and ultimately the, the scope of the tasks that, uh, that you're going to tackle with the autonomous system. For the purposes of uh, of uh, this talk and how we think about this, we just think of this as broadly a set of conditions under which the system must operate uh, correctly and safely. And we're going to formalize it slightly now so that we can actually use it in our in our math. So here's a 
little cartoon of an autonomous vehicle moving around the road. We're going to think uh, of some particular model of the dynamics that describes how the state of the world, uh, the system, and the environment evolves over time. It can be in part influenced by the robot, but it can also depend on the realization of the environment, which is uncertain. And we're capturing this with this uh, D term, which you can think of as the disturbance or the domain realization term. Um, and it's going to you know, change. Um, so these could be conditions that change over time, anything from uh, the friction coefficient that we're finding on the road to any particular parameters of our sensors or actuators that, that could sort of instantaneously change uh, over time within certain uh, bounds. Uh, and of course, the behavior of other agents, the, the control actions that they might decide to take. Um, on the other hand, we're going to usually have sensor measurements unless we uh, have the privilege of assuming that we have perfect uh, access to uh, all the state variables that matter, which won't usually be the case. And so here again, um, the measurements might uh, depend by some uh, environment realization that we are not entirely in control of. And so this allows us to at least start defining you know, a, working, a working formalization of the operational design domain that includes uh, deployment conditions for our system, environment, uh, environmental uh, realizations of the uncertainty, and of course, failure conditions. What is the set of, um, of states that we absolutely do not want our system to ever reach? So this would include collisions, but possibly also uh, certain um, unwanted conditions like you know, driving off the road or, or on the, in the opposite flow to traffic and things like that. So our hope is that with this, we can we can actually qualify our guarantees in the form of ODD theorems, meaning as long as the environment obeys the ODD, then safety will be guaranteed. Or more explicitly, if the realizations of the environment uncertainty satisfy the set of uh, allowable behaviors uh, over time, then the system's operation uh, from any deployment condition uh, inside our uh, you know, certified set of deployment conditions will uh, keep the system safe uh, for all future time. So this, for example, means that we're probably not going to want uh, to start driving our car when we're already in the middle of the highway. Um, uh, but it's probably okay to get to the middle of the highway as long as we've deployed our car, you know, in a, um, in a stop at a safe location where it's okay to stop and wait until there's a good opportunity to join traffic, merge into traffic in a, in a safe way. Okay. So, Safety from potential unserved agents. How do we go about this? This uh, has been a project that one of my PhD students, Zishu Zhang, has been working on for the last couple of years. And um, he uh, he came from, uh, from uh, a master's at uh, U Michigan where he was working with uh, some um, some uh, deep blurring of, of uh, uh, thermal videos and trying to make sense of uh, of uh, information, and you know, he he just came to Princeton with this uh, idea uh, that perception is really fragile, and we need to be we need to be ready to handle surprises in perception, and we need to be able to um, provide safety in spite of our sensors not always being able to tell us everything about the environment. Um, and in particular, we started talking about occlusions. Um, and indeed, in, in driving, we find them all of the time, right? We have blind intersections and we have blind summits. Anytime we're overtaking uh, a large vehicle, uh, there's going to be some part of the road that's being occluded by the vehicle itself. So how do we reason about safety in a way that is not overly conservative, but it's fully, um, fully rigorous, at least in terms of preventing um, safety violations for all the possible conditions that we think are, you know, that should be reasonably part of our operational design domain. Um, we we decided to focus on line of sight sensors because many I don't want to say all because we we have other types of sensors uh, like um, microphones and audio but many of the important sensors that we use in autonomous driving are line of sight sensors and so the main idea that that we wanted to pursue was to combine the closed loop. Um, uh, safety strategies that we know that we're able to compute with uh, dynamic game theory with um, open loop uncertainty propagation in the sense that when we don't know whether there's an agent or where the agent might be, we need to uh, be able to deal with that uh, um, uncertainty. So 
Um, the way we do this is with gains to theoretic safety assurance. And the, the big picture of this is that if we want to be able to um, remain safe with respect to all possible realizations of our uncertainty um, allowed by the ODD, then it's a useful thing to compute a strategy that works against the worst possible realization out of the entire set. Because that strategy, it turns out, will also be safe against all of the others. And this might not be uh, obvious. I don't I th don't think it was for me the first time I was looking at this. But it is a result of dynamic game theory. So if you find a strategy that is safe against the worst possible realization, it will be safe with respect to the others. One way to think about it sort of a uh, pseudo proof is, well, if there was another realization uh, against which I wasn't able to maintain safety with this strategy, then that would be a worse realization. So the initial one that I was defending against, it turns out, was not the worst case realization at all. Um, all right. So we can essentially represent this through a pursuit of Asian game. And these are uh, you know, pretty cool mathematical problems that were introduced initially in, this, in the uh, 1950s by Rufus Isaacs at the Rand Corporation. Um, he was working sort of across the whole from Richard Bellman, who was introducing dynamic programming. And Isaacs actually introduced a two-sided version of dynamic programming. And he was particularly interested in zero-sum games, where you know, I'm trying to minimize a quantity, the other agent's trying to maximize it, or the other way around. Um, and so when we solve these games essentially using dynamic programming in the cases where it's tractable to just throw a, a PDE solver at the problem, the solution to that problem actually encodes the optimal strategy for us to avoid a potentially adversarial pursuer. And um, I should clarify that here adversarial doesn't necessarily mean that the pursuer is going to do anything that is physically possible, just anything that is allowed by our ODD definition. right? So if we're, for example, uh, setting a limit on how fast uh, a vehicle could be, uh, could be driving on the road or how aggressively they can maneuver left and right, then those are the the bounds that we would impose. But then within that set of possibilities, we want to look at the worst one. And that's what we get with this kind of adversarial strategy. And so what's fantastic about this is that um, that strategy then keeps us safe with respect to everything in the ODD. Now, of course, the natural question is, OK, so you're considering an adversarial agent. Isn't this going to be way too conservative? And you're going to end up concluding, as we were saying earlier, that there's no way to be safe. And it turns out that if you do careful bookkeeping of um, your access to information, a lot of the time, and for many interesting problems, including, including this one, uh, you actually find uh, strategies that are not conservative at all, that actually can keep you safe from a very large set of the, of the state space, certainly much more than if you use um, just more naive forward reachable sets. But you're able to maintain safety rigorously with respect to anything that can happen in the ODD. In other words, the only way for you to have a safety violation is for some other agent to completely violate your assumptions or for the friction coefficient to suddenly be um, completely out of bounds. OK, so what people have done before in, in, this, uh, in this problem, um, and I just want to look at this quickly so that we can compare, is uh, you look at the road, you look at uh, objects that um, that uh, you see, and then you, you look at regions in the space where there might be an object that you're not seeing. And then you compute their forward reachable set. You just say, OK, where could these objects go in the future if they exist? And then you try to plan trajectories that never intersect with that forward reachable set. So you're trying to avoid them altogether. Now, the problem with that is that this is absolutely going to be overly conservative, primarily because it ignores the ability of your own ego vehicle to reduce the uncertainty as it goes, to adapt at each new moment in time to observations that are discarding a lot of these hypotheses that we were including in the forward reachable set. So you're going to have these forward reachable sets that grow, especially for long horizons, they grow very, very quickly, when in reality, as soon as you've moved for a few time steps, you, you could really have cut and you know pruned a lot of uh, branches in this in this tree of possibilities um, by simply making some observations so we want to have a uh, we want to have a principled way of keeping track of where hypothetical agents could be over time given our whole history of observations until now and also when we plan going forward 
no plan a pl no, no no come up with a plan that will work only given what we know now but rather one that will work given what we will know in the future and so in general it's very hard to account for all the things that you could uh, discover in the future uh, but it turns out that there's a way to add structure here that can really help us and that's where um i'm going to i'm going to skip that i'm going to skip this uh this little cartoon because you've already seen the the story with uh with uh game theoretic interactions um so I'm, I'm i'm just going to go straight into the the idea of the of the driving game and feedback information in that driving game right so you've got some kind of uh driving situation where then another agent comes in in this case the white car and uh you know perhaps you're worried that uh the interaction might play out poorly the other car could cut in front of you but there are you know there are other possible outcomes of the interaction and what you really want to think about is how these outcomes are sort of related to each other over time. So how that you know there's kind of a lattice of possible futures that connect to each other, and um, you know following the the principle of dynamic programming, we can go to the end of the of the game and figure out how much we like the different outcomes. Uh, we might be the happiest if they actually abort the maneuver, as in the case at the bottom right, uh, and uh, they might be happiest if they can fully complete the maneuver. We might be less happy, but at least on the top right we're giving them enough space to avoid an unsafe situation. And so then we can sort of uh, propagate uh, the strategies back in time and essentially solve instantaneous games for each possible uh, interaction from any given state and ultimately figure out what states we prefer at some intermediate uh, point. So for example, if you look at the two in the middle, we'd rather be, it turns out, in the bottom center than in the top center because from the bottom center, we have the leverage to keep going straight uh, without them merging in front of us, whereas from the top center, the best we can do is slow down and let them merge in front of us. So that means that at the very start of the game, we might decide to accelerate, to act strategically now, essentially, to have leverage later on. And that kind of idea translates not only to you know, driving interactions in general, but um, certainly also to, um, to, more general, um, to more general interactions, including zero-sum, um, encounters like uh, is the case in safety games. Um, so I just want to I just want to show you um, sort of how how this ends up panning out. So uh, one of my students, I mean, who was looking a lot at, at these kind of closed loop pursuit of Asian games, where we assume that we're able to see the other player, and um, uh, you know, it turns out that you you can eventually compute uh, what we call the the danger zone, uh, which is kind of this boundary. Um, such that past the boundary, you can no longer guarantee that you'll avoid a collision, at least not for all behaviors allowed by the ODD. Uh, but before you get to the boundary, and until you're on the boundary, you are able to take an action that sort of keeps you out of this danger zone and therefore out of collisions. And so you know you can you can formalize. Uh, don't worry too much about the, the the math here, but you can formalize your planning problem as you know try to optimize whatever performance you you care about, um, and. In this case, you could even have some kind of probabilistic inference about what the human is likely or unlikely to do, which can help you, um, you know, obtain good expected performance, uh, but always account for this kind of last resort uh, safety override that you can do at the boundary that is accounting for everything the human can do in the ODD. And this, are, uh, this turns out to work uh, quite well in practice because uh, instead of thinking now about low probabilities of collisions, what we have is low probabilities of having to resort to this emergency maneuver. Um, but we're always uh, maintaining safety for anything in the in the um, in the ODD. All right. So now, finally, let's uh, let's talk about how this works in the case of uh, the hidden uh, the hidden pursuer. What we have is actually. Um, a hybrid game that has two stages. So we have a first stage where we don't get to see the pursuer. And you know, perhaps we'll stay in the stage forever. But presumably, at some point before a potential collision with this hidden pursuer, the pursuer would become visible. And so it turns out that the question that really matters is, when the pursuer becomes visible, are they already unavoidable? Meaning, are we already in the danger zone? Um, or are they still far away enough from us that now that we can see them, we can we can certainly win the second stage of the game, which is one with a visible pursuer. In the worst case, um, the vehicle 
excuse me, the other vehicle will behave as a pursuer, or the other agent, could be a pedestrian, will behave as a pursuer, trying to seek a collision. But as long as we are sort of in the in the winning region, then um, there's nothing they can do to force us into a collision. And so it turns out that you can really boil down the problem of uh, avoiding collisions uh, with potentially hidden pursuers to the problem of ensuring that if you know the if you, if you can convey the solution to stage two of the game, ensuring that you always detect a vehicle, uh, a potential vehicle, before it becomes unavoidable in stage two. In other words, you want to make sure that you catch them before it's too late to avoid them. Um, so. It's uh, it, it becomes this kind of a two-stage game where the solution methods that you send the two games are separate because you're using closed-loop information in the second part of the game. You both can adapt to each other. And open-loop information in the first part of the game where, in the worst case, since you can't see the other vehicle, you have to assume that you have to pick a motion plan for your robot. And this motion plan does have to work for any uh, motion plan of the other vehicle and any starting position of the other vehicle within where they could uh, be at the current time. And so this is sort of a game where you give much more advantage to the other player, because you can imagine this being essentially the other player gets to see everything that I'm going to do and then uh, adapt accordingly. Um, but one thing that I, that I really want to talk about here is what our ODD uh, really is for this game and the current version that we have for the solution. So. We're assuming that the objects are detected when they are inside the ego uh, vehicle's uh, field of view. So we're assuming that within their field of view, the vehicles are, are you know, perfectly able to detect the object. Um, and uh, there's only one hidden adversary at a time. If you have an unlimited number of adversaries, of course, they could gang up on you and catch you. Um, we think that it might be interesting to extend this to a small number of adversaries, but greater than one. But you know, in fact, if you're thinking about uh, dangerous uh, objects emerging uh, into your field of view, um, it, it might be reasonable to assume that there's one at most sort of coming out of nowhere and trying to hit you uh, within any sort of uh, you know, uh, planning horizon of a few seconds. Um, but again, something that's uh, certainly worth extending. And then uh, the detected objects, uh, meaning objects that we already have seen that are not the adversary, um, are moving in a way that is somewhat predictable. And to the extent that we might have uncertainty, we will capture that uncertainty with the uh, forward reachable set. Um, so anyway, we're a little, we're a little uh, uh, tight on time. I realized that I, I, I uh, took a little, a little long to, to get to the, to the uh, end of the talk. But I, I do want to uh, sort of uh, point you to the, the main theoretical result that we have, which is what we had discussed. Um, we can define this idea of the forward hidden set, which is the set of all states that an initially hidden uh, agent somewhere in the regions that we're not able to see could reach by a certain time without first being detected. And that is a key part of the definition, without first being detected. Because then you have this really simple result that tells you that you will always be able to ensure safety from uh, uh, against pursuers starting anywhere in the current hidden set, as long as along the trajectory that you've planned in open loop, your the forward hidden set of uh, any potential vehicle with respect to your trajectory, meaning all the states that they could get to without being detected by your field of view along your trajectory, will never intersect with the danger zone, meaning will never intersect with the set of states from which they can hit you even after you detect them. So the great thing about this is this sort of provides an immediate algorithm that, that just says, hey, compute this forward hidden set and use this intersection as your collision check. So instead of just checking for collisions, check for intersections between these two sets and reject any plan that uh, that doesn't satisfy uh, this condition. So uh, uh, very quickly, I'll uh, I'll just show the, the video where you can see this actually at work. Um, so here we have an overtaking scenario. Yellow is our current hidden set. What we're not, uh, what we're not uh, able to see, and where there could be something, uh, and in red you you see the danger zone, and so what you're going to see now is there's a vehicle approaching, um, just emerging out of the hidden set. Uh, we also have a finite range of our field of view, so they just emerge into our field of view, and because they're still not uh, within our danger zone, we don't have to worry about this immediately, and in fact. 
uh, we can uh, complete the entire maneuver uh, without coming into a collision. We are allowing it to get into, into a tight one if it uh, so chooses. But here's a slightly different initialization where the vehicle is a little bit ahead. We detect it, and we detect it with enough time that we're actually able to, avo to avoid uh, them and abort the overtaking maneuver. What's great about this is that we can always initiate the maneuver because now we don't have to worry about initiating the maneuver into an unrecoverable encounter with somebody who's going to hit us no matter what we do. Uh, we tried this in a bunch of different scenarios. Here's uh, an interesting one in the intersections, a vehicle emerging from behind two trucks. In this first example, um, we clear the intersection. Uh, we detect them and decide that the best way to avoid them is to accelerate. Um, and in this other example, we detect them and because they're already quite uh, ahead, we, we come to a stop and we are able to do this. We have a guarantee that we will always be able to do this um, sufficiently quickly. Um, so anyway, I realize that we're uh, at, uh, at time and uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, folks have a hard stop at uh, 10. If so, um, uh, we can certainly leave it here. If folks want to stick around and have a bit of a, a longer uh, discussion, I'm certainly happy to uh, stick around for a few more minutes and chat about you know, limitations of, of the current assumptions and where this is all going. But um, I hope that this served to give you a general picture of what we think as the um, as a useful way to think about these problems and a nice decomposition structure that allows a robot to exploit uh, what it'll uh, what it'll be able to uh, discover over time, even though it doesn't yet know what that is. So anyway, thank you all so much, and uh, I'm happy to stick around if folks have questions. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for the talk. It was really nice. Um, colleagues, do you have any questions for Jamie? Oh, hi, Chris. Hey, hi, hey, this is Chris. Nice, uh, nice to see, nice to see you. you. Thanks for the great talk. I, I see you in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I thought it was really interesting the way you kind of you know, as, as a way to make this sort of idea of robust or provable behavior practical, you include limits in what the agent is sort of permitted to do as part of the ODD, right? You gave mm -hmm. examples of speed limits and limits on aggressive maneuvers, uh, you know, based on dynamics or, or whatever. It seems like your th th those set of last examples with the inclusion and the oncoming vehicle and the passing, uh, the, the, the sort of pass was really interesting. It seemed like you were also sort of implicitly including sort of legal limits. Like for example, the oncoming vehicle is not going to deviate from their lane, right? So you know that you still have the chance to like complete the pass, get back into your lane and and you will be safe. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about um, uh, just how, how one would kind of include those sort of legal or expected behavior limits into the ODD that you are using as part of this uh, this work? Yes, absolutely. No, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a super important question. And I think it's a very good point that you bring up where you're looking at this, uh, this video and saying, OK, well, sure, you can avoid a collision with the oncoming vehicle as long as the other vehicle doesn't sort of switch into your lane and then try to hit you. And so this is so absolutely. This is very important. I, that, uh, let, me, let me start by saying that I think that this is the the question is so important that I don't think we should be attempting to answer it by ourselves. And by that, I mean certainly not uh, by ourselves in university labs and not even by ourselves in uh, autonomous driving companies, um, because some of these questions really do need, uh, as you're saying, you know, this legal limits. There's legal. There's, there needs to be involvement from. Um, from uh, regulators and from and from uh, ethicists and uh, and ultimately from the public opinion in terms of what are reasonable assumptions to make. Um, so the way we go about this from the technical point of view is well, if we can provide tools that, given a reasonable ODD, can sort of translate that ODD into guarantees, and that's useful because presumably the tool itself, um, unless we got to sort of completely radically different family of ODDs uh, where the tool doesn't work, hopefully the tool would still work. And so if we change the, what the assumptions are on how much the other vehicle, for example, as you're saying, is allowed to deviate from their lane or from their current course, then maybe we'll be more conservative with the new ODD, but we'll still be, you know, the tool will still be able to give you, these are the guarantees and this is the behavior, the range of behavior that your vehicle can afford to, to, to carry out without, uh, without getting into trouble. 
Now, at the end of the day, in terms of the, you know how to how to try to quantify these things, and again, with with that big caveat that I don't think we should try to spell this out by ourselves. I think that a lot of the time the legal limits are too stringent to impose on others because they, you know we all know we many of us uh, occasionally drive beyond the you know the speed limit or the limits on what kind of maneuvers you're allowed to do and it would really and it would really be terrible if we you know some approaches this approaches out there like uh, responsibility sensitive safety and 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 and. Uh, so these uh, these safety approaches that are based on the idea it's not entirely unrelated right based on the idea that well as long as it's not my fault as long as i didn't do the wrong thing it should be acceptable to sometimes have accidents now the the problem that i have with this conceptually is that you have to be very careful in how you define that because if we all drove in such a way that we only avoid accidents when they would be our fault we would be having accidents all of the time right so a lot of sort of you know the miracle of how relatively seldom people get into serious accidents while driving has to do with our flexibility and our willingness to save the day even when somebody else is you know skipping a red light or or what have you. So I do think that we need to be more you know much more permissive with our uh, with our ODD when quantifying the behavior of others. That said, I also think that there are certain assumptions that we need to be able to make because, of course, otherwise you kind of you trivially get to the conclusion that nothing is safe. So if you know if multiple vehicles could gang up on you and drive actually to hit you from multiple angles, and there's lots of conditions under which you you simply would not be able to drive. Um, but you know, I, th I think there there's somewhere in between the overly restrictive and the completely uh, unrealistic and and unreasonable. I think there's a there's a region where Hopefully, this is speculative. Hopefully, there is limited sensitivity to how stringent your reviews are. You know, if you're saying like the maximum speed is, uh, you know, 120 miles per hour, or you're saying it's uh, 130 miles per hour, hopefully, you, you know, you're not going, you're not going to get significant changes in performance or in reliability of, of your safety uh, guarantee. Um, due to that, so I think that probably it's not as important to fine tune to the very last. Um, you know, sort of a unit of the of the parameters that you consider, but certainly uh, when considering things like, oh, can you deviate from your lane? There's, I think, there needs to be a careful discussion about that. I guess we have the we have the luxury as academics to not have to really answer those questions. You, on the other hand, of course, do have to at least take a reasonable first stab at uh, at some of these. Um, but I do believe that providing the tools is going to be very a very important step forward because then at least we can have a discussion at least we can try you know to to then tweak the odd and and try to figure out when under what odds we can get give reasonable guarantees with good uh system performance if we don't have that then we're kind of doing a little bit what some companies do where the best argument that you can make about your safety is to say well well you know uh, according to our internal data when people have the automated driving system on they are safer than when they don't have it on, um, and we're not going to look at whether these are highway miles or sort of you know uh, road uh, uh, mountain roads at night in the fog, right? Yeah, makes make, makes a lot of sense. Thank, thanks a lot for your answer. Uh, I mean, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks, Chris. Um, all right. Um, I think uh, so. Uh, Day or T? Am I pronouncing? Um, uh, T. Yeah. Hi. Tea. Uh, can I talk? Oh. I, I actually have question as well. I work a lot with occlusion as well. Just curious. So, two questions. One question is: In this scenario, are we making assumption about lead vehicles? So this is a problem, right? You can overtake it from closer to them, but you have less visibility. But you need less range to overtake them. Mm -hmm. If you start overtake from further distance, you you have more visibility of an oncoming lane, but it also take longer time. So, so absolutely. Yeah, just, just, I mean, again, my, my main point is, do we make any assumption about lead vehicles? If they are sort of adversarial as well, can they start, try to prevent us from being able to overtake at all? Or if we take into their uncertainty, like how that does play into it? Yeah, no, you that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really great point. Um, and it kind of ties again to, to the idea of the ODD, right? So we, we do place assumptions on the, in the case of the truck, on the behavior of the truck. And what we, what we do is, is we're limiting the, the acceleration of the truck so how aggressively the car the, the truck can slam on the brakes or hit the accelerator 
We're also assuming in this case that the truck is not changing lanes, which absolutely could be questioned. And then you could say, well, what if we're trying to overtake? And just as we do that, the truck starts switching lanes, right? Um, what the way that we that we normally think about this? So in this case, we're just representing the truck with this kind of forward reachable set, and, we're, and then we're saying like, hey, as long as the truck, but you know, it's a fairly small forward reachable set because the truck is right now sort of cruising on the highway, so we can afford to to um, assume that they're not going to move in a way that's drastically different. Um, so two comments with respect to this. First, if the truck does start to move drastically differently that will then lead to a violation of your ODD. And you can detect that quickly. That's the nice thing of having one, right? So that you can detect that quickly and say, hey, wait a moment. Either I need to recompute my safety uh, conditions to account for the new motion of the truck, or I need to immediately fall back into my avoidance maneuver while I still have it or while I'm still close enough to uh, my, my range of assumptions that I can that I can sort of fall back, right? And so there's there's some work that we've done in the past where you you can basically keep track of um, all of the variables that you don't control, but that are part of your of your bound. And as they approach the boundary of the bound, you essentially say, "Hey, I'm not going to risk it," and you start falling back uh, because they could uh, violate the bound, right? And that that works as long as the violations of the bound happen in a way that is gradual, as opposed to instantaneous. Like suddenly the truck goes straight into like a, a whatever complete swerve out of the lane, and then um, you may not you may not have. Uh, uh, enough time to to respond to that but in but uh the the first point is that you should be able to to detect this and and uh fall back in at least in many cases uh the other the other point that uh i think is relevant is compositionality is super important right so your odd uh, this is you know it's a, a little demo that we're doing we're not by any means building the whole system right but when you're building the whole system a useful way to think about your odd is you can you can allow multiple scenarios, but they need to be in some sense mutually exclusive. In other words, if it just so happens that you have an oncoming vehicle coming right to hit you, and at the same time the vehicle they're overtaking starts making a lane change, and at the same time there's some uh, you know other vehicle coming from behind you to also hit you, then sure, very likely that is a no-win scenario. You can also argue that in such a scenario probably no driver could possibly uh, maintain safety. And probably the scenario is so um, so unpredictable in nature that uh, it, you wouldn't expect a reason, you know, a, 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 an expert human driver in full use of their capabilities to maintain, uh, to, to see that, you know, coming and maintain safety in that condition. So what you can do instead is you can say, okay, let me, cons let me make sure that I can handle any one of these three scenarios independently. So that unless there's this kind of you know terrible alignment of the planets against me, I can I can guarantee safety, right? And so and what then you can do is as soon as one of these conditions is already happening, then you know you you go into avoidance mode uh, if you are not very confident that the other two are not going to happen. Does that make sense? So then it allows you to have this kind of compositionality where all the bad things are not allowed to happen at once and be discovered at once, um, and then this. Uh, and then this allows you to kind of structure, but you know this is part of the uh, the structure of the ODD, right? So you can say, I'm able to handle uh, the vehicle I'm overtaking changing lanes on me while I'm trying to overtake, or an oncoming vehicle coming from out of nowhere at maximum speed trying to hit me, or uh, a vehicle coming from behind trying to hit me as well. And then you may be able to allow certain combinations of them, but perhaps in mild diversion. So if the truck is changing lanes, then the vehicle that's oncoming uh, perhaps then will not change lanes or will, you know, not be pursuing me as aggressively. Again, it's not, it, it, to some degree, this should not be just up to us. Somebody should say, hey, no, that's not reasonable. What Jaime just said is complete bogus, and I we do not want a system to be deployed uh, relying on those assumptions. And that's perfectly fine. But I think having a language to express these things is useful. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Hey, Jaime. Uh, great talk. Um, I guess I want to piggyback on like the reference that you made a second ago, where um, you said, oh, um, you, maybe like three things will not happen at the same time, but like you have maybe already like contingency plans or, or, or uh, policies in place for like, I guess, uh, pairwise interactions, which I think that's what you're alluding to, maybe. Um, my question to you would be, what would you, like, given that you have these tools, how would you combine them in a way where you have multiple agents where like, you know, you won't be able to solve the full fledged uh, problem with like 
all the agents interacting because the dimensionality is too large. But hmm. how would you, you know, work with this pairwise uh, knowledge that you have? Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great point. And by the way, I don't mean to I don't mean to uh, imply in any way that you should. I, I am I I am a major skeptic of any safety assurance method that only works for pairwise interactions, um, because I mean that's just I mean and especially on autonomous driving. That's when does that ever happen? So. Um, in terms of scalability, I think that you that you certainly need to be able to account for as many agents as you think are going to be actively involved in your in in your safety maneuver, which could itself be interactive. Um, so to me, this does mean that a lot of the traditional methods that we've been using to compute these nice sets are out, right? So solving a Hamilton Jacobi uh, PDE to compute your safe set is wonderful when your system is low dimensional. Often these systems are not that low dimensional to begin with in terms of their dynamics, um, but it you know if if that means that you're going to have to start making assumptions like well I'm on an infinite straight road and I only consider the relative uh, position along the road of these two vehicles that I can drop one state dimension and also vehicles are not allowed to you know turn or do something that is relevant for them to do that really starts to get you into into trouble so something that um, because I didn't want to go beyond the beyond the hour because um, that then means that we don't have discussion. Um, I, I didn't really get into into much detail there, but I I do think that the more promising way to think about this is with tractable methods, very likely along the lines of uh, trajectory optimization based methods that allow you to account for information structure properly. So things like um, uh, mold, you know, game theoretic uh, differential dynamic programming or, or uh, ILQ games, iterative, iterative linear quadratic games, um, which of course you're familiar with because you you uh, were part of the uh, early papers. And so with these techniques, you can really scale it up not to 20 agents. I think I don't think that 20 agents are typically relevant to the interactive part of your of your decisions, right? But something like three or four agents can actually, you know, it's not unreasonable to expect that that can happen in some decision in some uh, situations. Uh, and so I think that in those cases, you should be able to account for three or four agents. Now, if you assume that all four agents are being adversarial against you in the worst possible way, you're probably going to get in uh, into one of these no win situations. So you will have to do a little bit of thinking about how you're now going to manage how adversarial each of these agents can be in each of the possible scenarios, right? So you can have one scenario where the first agent is being more adversarial, but then the others are being interactive but less adversarial. Another one where two of the agents are quite adversarial and two are not as much. So you know that's a different story. But in terms of computing the interaction, I think that you should be able to scale it um, beyond pairwise interactions. Um, there's a different story here which is when we're thinking about these uh, forward hidden sets, by the way, the forward hidden set, you can compute it explicitly with Hamilton Jacobi computation, but fortunately, and this is what we're actually in the process of doing right now, you can also compute it implicitly through trajectory optimization. So what you can essentially do is you can say, well, okay, I need to plan a trajectory for my, uh, for my ego vehicle such that when another vehicle plans a trajectory based on ours, meaning you know, because of the open loop information structure, we have to fix our trajectory that we've planned. And now the other vehicle gets to optimize their trajectory, their hidden trajectory uh, for our entire trajectory, but they need to do so while dodging our field of view if they want to get to to really hurt us. Or they need rather they need to dodge our field of view until they get into the danger zone. And so it turns out that we can do this with trajectory optimization. Essentially, it's a reach avoid ILQ game. And you can uh, and you compute you can compute answers to that efficiently, so that's the that's the way that I think this this can actually scale, and then you can start to do this for more uh, for more vehicles. Now, the other part of this is you should not assume that the other vehicles that are not part of the interaction aren't there. What you can do is assume you know if if you're confident that essentially what they're going to do is independent of your your actions during the avoidance maneuver. Uh, is you, you can just fix their behavior as moving obstacles. And that's very important because it means that they're no longer part of your state space. So you can reduce significantly 
the uh, the computational uh, burden of solving this. Now, in some cases, if you're not sure how they're going to move, they might be moving obstacles with a growing size because they're being represented by the forward reachable set. Um, but in many cases, we're, this is what we're doing with the truck, and it it's not a deal breaker. It doesn't, it, you know, it's not like oh, I'm I'm unable to avoid a collision with this truck as long as you're not. Uh, assuming that the truck is adversarial, then you essentially have a nominal forward reachable set that doesn't grow too quickly. Thank you. All right. Um, excellent. Well, we technically have a, a couple more minutes. I don't know. Yeah, Chris, do you have a, another uh, comment or question or complaint? That's a great, great, great question. I, I don't, I don't really. I mean, I, I'm still, you know, I'm still thinking about um, how these tools can be, like, how, you know, how, how to best sort of leverage these tools. Like, what is the final solution going to look like? Like, to your point, I, 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 I really think that um, there is a real place for these sorts of tools in developing sort of the next generation of AV software. But I think that. To your like, like you were discussing, I think that it needs to be sort of a combination. Like, I think we need to have both a set of um, relatively restrictive uh, ODDs on other agents, and as long as we make assumptions that the other agents, you know, will always stay within those uh, behaviors then we mm -hmm. can guarantee have 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 reliable guarantees but that method is sort of necessary but not sufficient to have good driving behavior right um right. that we would we also need to combine that with a maybe a more probabilistic um uh yes. approach or formulation where we have no guarantees using just those formulations but we have you know um uh kind of in maybe in a simulation based way some kind of demonstrably safe behavior in expectation um using sort of a, a softer approach and i think we sort of need both of those and i think neither of them in isolation is really sufficient for getting actual practical real life driving behavior um in in in, in the real world but I, I i haven't it's been a little while since i thought about this so I, I i don't have my thoughts super superly kind of well well formulated but that's sort of where where my head is at right now no absolutely i i think you're i think you're absolutely right i i i never think about these uh these tools as sort of the the, the you know the thing that by itself plans for your uh, for your uh, autonomous system um I think you know we we've done a little bit of exploration of of this combination of probabilistic and and uh, and worst case or you know whatever ODD wide uh, guarantees uh, or planning methods, and um, one thing that we have found is that you actually get really good uh, performance when you when you make the probabilistic efficiency sort of you know performance driven uh, planning method aware of the sort of the, the uh, safety driven uh, ODD based overrides. So when you have uh, this, this is a paper by um, Jaime, my other PhD student, we were, I guess I, I showed briefly the little picture of, you can have a, you know, a problem with some probabilistic uh, objective. And, and, and there what we actually do is we say, okay, we compute this boundary of safety for the ODD where if you really get to this point, you need to take and you know an emergency um, uh, an emergency maneuver in response to that to uh, make sure that you don't get into a situation for, where you could have an accident. Um, and again, thanks to us, thanks to accounting for your ability to adapt to things, usually these boundaries are not that you know it's not like you have to stay meters away from the other car. You just you know it's it's just you don't you have to just not get into what we call the the mouse trap state where if suddenly they they hit the brakes, you're definitely going to eat them, um, which could totally blindside your probabilistic planner because your probabilistic planner just said, ah, what are the odds are going to do that? Um, but then on the other hand, then the probabilistic planner, if it knows where that boundary is, then it's going to try to, with very high probability, steer clear of that boundary. And that's where this, that's where the magic happens. And you combine kind of the two approaches because then 
the safety, you know, the worst case safety analysis doesn't care about performance. Um, and once you hit that boundary, it's just going to override you. But the efficiency planner is actually saying, okay, wait, given how this vehicle is behaving right now, how likely is it that they're going to behave in such a way that the boundary is going to move towards me and then I'm going to get overridden? And so then what you see is that suddenly the um, probabilistic planner itself is following nice and smooth trajectories that are not jerky at all because it's never hitting the boundary. Uh, usually it's because it's aware of the boundary and the boundary usually means an uncomfortable maneuver that if possible you should avoid with high probability. Um, you essentially almost never hit the boundary. And the, essentially the only cases where you hit the boundary is when the probabilistic planner determines that it's worth it to have this trade-off where maybe you know 99 times you're going to uh, successfully complete this maneuver in the most efficient way. And then one of those 100 times, you're going to need to bite the bullet and have the safety override. Um, but overall, you know, because of whatever trade-off you've put into the system, it's worth it in that case. But the nice thing is then you're never trading off. You're never saying like, oh, well, every now and then I'll have an accident. You're just saying every now and then there's going to be an uncomfortable avoidance maneuver. Um, and I think that's at least one you know, promising way of, of combining these, uh, these things, provided that, as you say, we're able to uh, put all of the steps in place to have an ODD that makes sense to us that we, that we are comfortable uh, defining for our systems. Um, great. And I think there's yeah, there's a I, question. I, I have a question, but I'm not sure we have enough time to answer. You have enough time to answer. But yeah, basically, I mean, at least this scenario is interesting. But the other common case of occlusion is on brain intersections where, where the occlusion doesn't really change until you make an action. So a lot of time, if the occlusion, you, you, I think a lot of time the occlusion won't change until you you make a like action. So in that case, mm -hmm. like, like how would this work when the ocean is pretty heavy? Where I, I guess depending on ODD, you might say it's out of ODD and you just you can't operate. But just curious if you have any insight on how that works. No, yeah. no, no, I think that so you're thinking of intersections where basically until you get to the intersection, it's, it's like a blind stop sign, right? Like you, until you get to the intersection itself, you don't know if there's somebody coming. So these, um, so the nice thing it's the nice thing about this system is that you know it's it's, it's quite general, so it just handles the intersection in a way that is reasonable, I would say it's not necessarily the most impressive because it's similar to what you would get if you coded up a heuristic that says, get to the intersection, then start nudging forward. But the nice thing about it is that you don't have to code it up manually, right? So th what this thing, uh, what this method does is it approaches the intersection and then what's going to happen is it's going to say, look, the f beyond the sort of entrance to the intersection, right? That is part of my forward hidden set for vehicles that could be upstream of say the you know the sort of the oncoming lane from the perpendicular road um and you know one or two time steps forward into that um th there are states that are both in the danger zone meaning if i go there i can you know if, if if i if i go there if i go forward and there is something there i could get into trouble and they're in the forward hidden set because they could get there without me seeing them until it's too late and so then what's going to happen is you're going to reject any trajectory that just sort of barges into the intersection, but you're going to accept trajectories that slowly enter the intersection. So you slow down, enter the intersection slowly, and the reason that you accept those trajectories is that you're able to come to a stop, essentially, before entering the sort of the, the path of the other, the potential path of the other vehicle. And so then what happens from that point on is once you're moving slowly and approaching the intersection, as your as your field of view finally starts to expand, the forward hidden set starts to retract. Um, so I didn't I didn't show the I didn't show the um, the pictures of how the the forward hidden set sort of evolves over time, but um, essentially, let's see if I can uh, just very quickly show you a little uh, a uh, little. Quick, uh, quick, one quick question is: so you yeah. must be able to compute a forward hidden set, like, like how the occlusion would change mm -hmm. forward in time as well, right? Based on where you are. Yes, yes. So this is very, this is very important. The forward hidden, the forward hidden set that you get, which you're representing with this little, with this little bluish region over here in the in the bottom left. So the top left is the current hidden set, and the bottom left is the in blue is the forward hidden set. This is the forward hidden set for a particular candidate trajectory. So you're saying if I move in this way, where could things be without me seeing them? at each point along the way for this trajectory, right? And so then what you have to do 
is make sure that you don't you don't end up with this uh, intersection. So the example that we have here, there is an intersection between the danger zone in yellow and the and the forward and set in blue, which is not a uh, which is not uh, acceptable. But you know, a different trajectory that slows down gets a little behind the truck in this case, and then then moves forward. It, it is safe. And the reason it's safe is that essentially what, what's going to happen is as you move along that trajectory, your field of view is pushing the blue set back. That's the way you can think about it. So as you move, as you move forward, you're pushing the forward hand set back. As your field of view, you know, you approach the intersection and your field of view starts expanding. And then the forward hand set is sort of being um, being uh, eaten away by your field of view. And that's what allows you to ultimately recover the um you know, to ultimately move into the intersection. This is not exactly the same. Uh, um, sorry, the same example in the in the intersection, but it is a little bit similar. So if I can pause the video right here, okay. So I, I apologies for the changing color scheme. So here, the the hidden set is this yellow, and also this kind of uh, gray. The 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 gray behind the two trucks. If you look at the map on the left, um, you can see the the hidden set behind the trucks, which is in this sort of grayish which is the overlap of yellow and blue um so in this case blue is the danger zone and yellow is the, the hidden side you can see that the vehicle is it's in there but as you start approaching the intersection you can see that you're pushing the yellow set is getting smaller and smaller uh because you're you're gaining uh your field of view is advancing right so eventually you can see how it's retracting similarly for the field of the yellow region ahead of you at the top of the map is also retracting as you move forward. Um, so, so the the cool thing here is that from the game theoretic point of view, what you're actually doing is you are using your your field of view kind of as an obstacle to potential pursuers that could exist. Because by by pushing your field of view forward, you're preventing pursuers from approaching you without being detected. So you can sort of think of your field of view as very much an active sort of a, it's a, you know it's a a tool that you're using to make the potential pursuers lose the game against you and not be able to hit you. Um, so anyway, in the case of the intersection, unfortunately, I don't have an example for for what you're describing, which I think I understand what you mean. Just kind of no visibility until you get there. But then what would happen is as your field of view opens up, that's when it pushes away the, the yellow regions, and then suddenly you're able to enter the intersection. But you would have to slow down before you go in, right? Which kind of makes sense. Uh, guys, sorry to interrupt. I think we are a little bit out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie, for a nice talk. We had so many questions. It's like uh, very, very interesting. Unfortunately, <laughs> need to stop right now. Yeah, no, of yeah. course. It's been great. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, I've really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, thank you uh, all for the fantastic questions. And uh, yeah, if you you know if you'd like to. To chat a little more, if any of uh, any of what you've seen uh, seems uh, interesting and worth following up on, I'd love to to have follow up discussions. I added my email there to the slide. Um, yeah, I'd be uh, super happy to chat more. And uh, in any case, yeah, have a have a fantastic rest of the week. And it's been it's been nice seeing you all. The same for you. Yeah. Bye, yeah, man. Thanks, Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Take care.